Hi folks, my name is Steve Grono, and uh, I'm here to tell you about an insane collection of maritime antiques uh, that uh, I've uh, accumulated over the last 35 years. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a historian, a little bit of an amateur historian. My favorite hobby is, happens to be the interest of the Lighthouse Service and the Life Saving Service. I got into this crazy collection, I think, because at a very young age, my grandfather took me fishing on Belle Isle when I was 10 years old and handed a pole to me, two hooks and a lead sinker. And before I knew it, I had two perch jumping away on that pole. And 15 minutes later, this red wall came by on Belle Isle and the Detroit River, and it was the Edmund Fitzgerald. And my grandfather knew the captain, told me stories about the Fitzgerald, and got me kind of interested in maritime uh, events in history. So as I got older, got married, bought a boat, first thing we wanted to do is go boating on the Great Lakes and visit lighthouses. So that's sort of the genesis of this insane collection that I have here. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple quick things, a couple of my favorite items, how I got them, and uh, a little bit of brief history on both of these agencies, the Life Saving Service and the Lighthouse Service. So first of all, I'm sitting right here at a keeper's desk. Uh, this is full of records and logs from the um, early days of the Life Saving Service, the Lighthouse Establishment as it was known in those days, and they actually kept a daily written log of everything that happened in the Lighthouse. In addition to that, the Lighthouse Service and the Life Saving Service worked together uh, to save lives at sea. And one of the craziest things is most of the U.S. lighthouses, not very many miles down the beach eventually you found a life saving station. So sometimes when the shipwrecks would happen, the keepers from the lighthouse would go to the rescue, sometimes it would be the life saving service. The artifacts around me here are all very rare pieces from that era of the life saving service. You see these couple of cannons down here. These are some of my favorite items in this collection because both of these cannons were used by the actual life saving service, which existed from 1874 to 1914 before the US Coast Guard absorbed them. And each of them has its own story of actual rescues that were performed on the Great Lakes and the Atlantic and Pacific seaboards. So my little collection includes a couple of these, they're called Lyle guns. They fire a 19 pound steel projectile over 300 yards to the shipwreck. And they rig a line called a Hauser line that is rigged up to set up with a breeches buoy. A breeches buoy is this little item over here in the corner, which is a set of canvas pants in a life ring basically. And it's geared in order to put a person in there and drag them from the shipwreck back to shore. So it's an amazing little part of our nation's history. Not a lot of people know about it. All of the woodcut drawings and stuff are historical stories about these heroic deeds that the lifesavers would carry out. And many of them in the lifesaving service did not make it back to shore. We lost an entire crew in South Carolina during a rescue at one point in 1888. Uh, their motto was, <laughs> you have to go out, but you don't necessarily have to come back. <laughs> so they were extremely heroic people. Um, so another one of my favorite elements in this collection is over here. This is a IOV burner. It's called an incandescent oil vapor burner. And this thing actually would be inside of a first order lighthouse lens, which is shown in this little picture I have up here with this keeper standing inside lighting the IOV burner for the night. It would take up to 2000 candle power here when it was fully functional and it would illuminate a distance in a first order lens of 26 miles out to sea. I've got it actually restored and working and functioning and sometimes at some of our fundraisers we light this thing up and, and razzle dazzle people with how they used to do it in the old days. The very first lens I ever acquired is this third middle right here. It's an 800 millimeter lens and it came from Australia. There was an auction back in the 1960s when the country of Australia decided it no longer needed to save any of these uh, old artifacts. So they actually just put them all in a warehouse, put a notice in a newspaper and auction them all off. And there were some people that bought them who I met through the internet years ago. And I was finally able to acquire this magnificent lens. This is a third middle fixed 800 millimeter Fresnel Beehive style lens. I did a full restoration on it. It was my first restoration and I had a ball doing it. It took two years uh, and a lot of man hours, but we got it back to its original glory. And one of the illuminants in here is an actual thousand watt bulb changer from that era. Uh, previous to the bulb changer, it would have had a, a capillary oil lamp in it followed by this electric lamp, which was then followed by solarization, and all of these artifacts became obsolete and scrapped out. Um, another one of my favorite areas in the museum is over here. This is a, uh, a case full of everything that the lighthouse keeper would have used in his daily job, the tools of the trade, so to speak. And that's right here in this case. Um, it's just an amazing, crazy collection of brass artifacts, which 
Each one of them played a vital role in maintaining the light, the lens, the lantern room, the brass measures for the oil, the gallon cans that came up through the steps of the lighthouse tower had to be carried by hand. These 35, 45 pound cans of oil up and down the stairs every day and every night. Uh, it's just a wonderful little collection of all the things that have the thumbprints and fingerprints of actual light keepers back in the day on them. So it's one of my absolute most favorite uh, areas of the museum. Keepers got very bored in their jobs because they were in remote light stations. They never had a chance to actually interact with other people very much. So one of the things they look forward to is books. And the Lighthouse Service actually created these amazing strong boxes, which are called traveling libraries. And this one is an actual traveling library, number 159 from the day. And inside of it would be books, magazines, and news from the day. So once a year, the, the tender that would service the Lighthouse would come, and they would have one of these strong boxes on board from the previous light station that they would bring to the next stop and then they would pick up the one that they had and take it to the next station so there was this giant rotation system and it was one of the happiest moments of the, of the year for the Lightkeepers families because they would already memorized all these books year, word for word and <laughs> they needed some new material. So that's kind of an incredible little thing that they did back in that day. Uh, one of the other items in the collection over here is a foghorn. So this device on the wall here is a small scaled down version of a foghorn that would have been um, at any of our nation's lighthouses. This one is actually up and running and I have it rigged to compressed air. So I'm gonna give you a treat and let you know what it sounds like. Whoa, that might blow your ears out if you're, not, if you're too close to it. But you can imagine what it would sound like on something this big, which is not actually from a lighthouse but a smaller scaled down version, to the actual lighthouse foghorns, which are hanging up over here that are 10 times the size of the one I just showed you. And there's not only one, but there's two of those. So you can imagine those foghorns blasting out over the sea, warning mariners of perils. Uh, and you could go through a dense fog over nine miles with two foghorns of that size. Incredible stuff. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of one of the other things that people always ask me about is how did they light the light? And what was the earliest form of illumination in lighthouses? And I happen to be very fortunate to have, a, to, to have found one of the earliest forms of lighthouse lenses known in existence right here. This little piece of glass, a simple bullseye, flat on one side, convex on the other side, was one of the very first items used in a lighthouse in order to guide mariners uh, back to safe harbor. The problem is, is when they put the candle behind it, the light actually ended up diminishing the effectiveness of the light, and it was better for just the candle to be up there <laughs> than with the lens. So it went out of favor very quickly. It was quickly replaced by your modern Fresnel lens. This is a Fresnel lens of the fourth order. As you can see, it's a beautifully crafted piece of engineering, very finely cut crown glass, brass frame, center dioptric, powered inside by an acetylene burner. And uh, this happened to be an 1874 example of a fourth order Fresnel lens that we came across many years ago. A lot of the artifacts in our collection came from all different sources all over the world. Um, one of the most cool stories I have to sort of wrap up with you on is a uh, trip that we took to the Middle East. So we heard from this English gentleman who runs the Middle East Aids to Navigation Service, or MENAS, which is located on the island of Bahrain in the Persian Gulf and met him through some contacts on the internet. He says, hey, we've got a bunch of old artifacts that we're gonna scrap out, and would you have any interest in them? He sent us some pictures, and I said, woohoo, you need to stop right there, we're gonna book a plane, and we're gonna come, and we're gonna clean you out. So I sent him, I wired him some money, and I arranged for a 40-foot seagoing container uh, to be delivered to their storage yard. Uh, they brought a crane in, took the wheels off so the, uh, so the container sat right on the ground. And my, my apprentice and I, Chad Kaiser and I, flew to Bahrain and we began packing up all of these artifacts. And this is one of the artifacts that we found on the island of Bahrain. This is an incredible piece. It's, a, it's called a double bullseye rotating flashing lens. This lens is fourth order, extends about 17 miles out to sea. But the really unique thing about this lens is it's powered 100% by acetylene gas meaning once the gas pressure is delivered to it, it goes, passes through a series of diaphragms, winds a clock spring, 
And by virtue of the clock spring's power sitting on this bed of mercury, it rotates this lens in perpetual movement. Not only that, there is a mechanism inside the lens whereby the mantle, which once ignited and lights up, the mantle will burn for an indefinite number of hours. But the cool thing is, is when that mantle burns out, the flame from the acetylene burns through a wood shim, which then trips another spring, which rotates the mantle out of position and a new mantle into position. And it can do that up to four times without any human being ever being involved with the maintenance of this lens. So it was an incredible piece of technology back in the 1930s and 40s when they came up with this. And this is one of the finest examples of it, the most complete examples of it that we, we know to exist. A very, very fun little piece to have in the collection. Uh, lastly, if you're interested in anything to do with fog signals, this is something we're pretty proud of. We restored this. It took us about a, seven months to restore this. It's called a Gamewell Bell Striker. And so before the days of the horn you just heard, or before the days of um, GPS, um, the fog signal was the only way for the mariner to know there was danger in the area. This one, which was created by John Gamewell, uh, was also used in many of our nation's fire stations back in the day. And it's very, very cool. I've actually restored this one into operating condition. And I'm going to operate it for you here so you get a little flavor of how it worked. Now, the keeper, of course, had to wind up the weight. This weight here is only a few inches off the ground. Typically, it would be 35 feet off the ground. It would have about 100 pounds of weight here. And by virtue of tripping a simple trip mechanism, it would mechanically throw the hammer back and smack the bell. And this is what it would sound like. And you can still hear that ringing for quite some time. And then it would create a series of those. The frequency of those uh, bongs would coincide with the same flash characteristic of the light. So the, if the mariner could hear and count the interval between the sounds, he would be able to look at his chart and he'd be able to tell what station he was hearing and what direction it was coming from. So a very cool piece of early navigation history in kind of working order. So people kind of enjoy that stuff. But other than that, uh, we would welcome anybody that's interested to come and visit the museum. Uh, we hold this open for fundraisers, for nonprofits, um, and we really enjoy youth coming and visiting us because young, young folks, it's kind of fun for them to learn about how we used to do it in the old days, before everything was on a screen and operated with your thumbs. So uh, with that, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, meeting all of you. Uh, feel free to contact me. My company is Chestnut Real Estate right here in Brighton. And through them, you can find me, and then you can have a tour of the museum. So thanks again.